In this video we're going to deal with means. Now we get this term from really the Robbins definition of economics. The Robbins definition is an extremely famous definition of economics, one well worth committing to memory. It says that economics is a science which considers human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. So we've got scarce means, and this is the subject matter of the video. We're going to talk here about the means of production. The means to the satisfaction of our material wants is through production. So that's how we satisfy our material wants. Our material wants uh, being clothing, food, shelter, and then the higher order ones, the, the luxury items. And the cars, the household goods and so on. So what we've got is, if you like, um, a demand for various items, a requirement on the part of people. The requirements, however, need satisfying and they're satisfied through the material wants, through production. Now let's look at the classification of resources. Output in a given time period will depend on the amount of labour. Well, that's one key resource that's required. Everything happens through labour. Uh, labour build the factories, labour build the roads, labour build the goods and services that we want. So someone has to produce it. And that's the labour, the labour force. So. When we classify resources, the first one we encounter would be labour. Next we could have land. Land is all natural resources, not just land as we classically, classically think of it, but land could be fish in the sea or forestry. or um, All natural resources are land. We classify them as land. So we have two types of resource. We have labour at the moment that is the active resource, the one that makes the things that we want, and land, all the natural resources that we can use. Bearing in mind we live on a small planet that's probably overpopulated, circling the local sun, we haven't got a lot of natural resources. We've only got what's on the planet. So natural resources are finite, they're not infinite. Then we've got capital. Well, in a sense, capital is just saved up labour. People in the past built machines and some of the machines that were built were used to make other machines and those machines were used to make the next generation of machines. So in a sense, everything can be traced back to labour. But capital, we have to be practical and, and draw a line somewhere. So we say capital is the amount of equipment that we've got today. So in a sense we've broken the link with labour. We say yes it came from the past, uh, it's the accumulation of labour over the over hundreds of years, probably over thousands of years. But anyway the point is we, we stop and we say yes capital is uh, a resource that can be used in combination with labour and used to process items from the land, uh, wood, uh, natural resources, minerals and so on. So capital is used with labour to process uh, the output, the natural outputs. So capital typically when we think of it we think of machinery, buildings and so on, items used for production. And the final classification resource is enterprise. Someone must have the idea for production. Someone must organize it. Someone must decide on what's going to be produced. Someone must take risk. Someone must think this product is a good idea, this product will sell, let's produce this product. And if it doesn't sell, that person is responsible. If it does sell, that person will be rewarded with profits. So we have four factors of production as we call them. 
These are four factors of production, labour, land, capital and enterprise. There are rewards to the four factors of production. Labour, for example, is paid a wage or a salary. So that's what labour gets. Land, land gets um, rent. It's a payment to the natural resource, rent. And capital receives a rate of return. It's like the rate of interest. And enterprise receives profits. The resources can be combined in varying proportions. That's a characteristic of the resources. So we can have more capital, perhaps less workers, more workers, less capital. Um, the, to some extent, land is substitutable as well. Sometimes production has to take place in a very big space. But as capital changes, capital becomes more efficient and better machines are made, perhaps less space is required. In the long run, the amount of land, labour, capital used in the production process can be varied. So the amount of resources used can be varied as technology changes. Sometimes proportions of the factors of production, as I said, the factors of production are the land, labour, capital and entrepreneurship, or enterprise as we called it earlier. So we have four factors of production and the proportions of the factors of production, uh, sometimes they have to be fixed, as in the case of, let's say, we need one man per one machine. That's a fixed proportion. But again, technology is eroding that. Technology is eating into it. Technology is uh, making robotics more commonplace and machines tend to be more automated and perhaps uh, it's not just a question of one person controlling the machine. Perhaps the machine only needs to be turned on and maintained and turned off at the end. So the proportions is debatable. But classically, we believe that some proportions have to be fixed. One man, one machine. Resources are in limited quantity. As I said earlier, we inhabit a little planet and there are a lot of us on the planet. We all want more. We all want good lives. We all want more resources. But these resources can only come from the planet and we're using up the resource at an alarming rate. We're destroying the climate because we need more production. We also have an urgency to drive cars to work and drive them for leisure. We are putting a lot of stresses on the planet. So resources are limited in quantity and we have to realize that. But insofar as they are limited, they command a price. Unfortunately, or fortunately, some items can't be priced because they are what we call free goods. And that's why we abuse them. So we abuse the planet. And that's why the, the polar ice caps are melting. Uh, air has been abused. We pollute the air. All economic goods are scarce in supply. It is the scarcity of goods in relation to their demand that gives them a price. So scarcity determines the price of economic goods. And economic goods are goods that are scarce in supply relative to want. There are goods that we want, but they're scarce, and that means they command a price. That's where the pricing system comes from. The Factors of production are no different from other goods. We buy and sell our labour as we buy and sell any other commodity. Uh, I know we, we think of ourselves, we are human and we consider ourselves as having dignity and pride in ourselves. And that is the way it should be. But we also sell ourselves on the market. We acquire qualifications and then we offer ourselves to the highest bidder. I presume. 
And that's, in a sense, no different to buying items in the supermarket. Generally, resources are versatile. For example, land may be used for a variety of sources, from agriculture to house building to sports facilities or whatever. So land may be used for a variety of sources. It's versatile. There are some exceptions to this characteristic. For example, sometimes machines are built for a single task. And that's not versatile, that's locked in. So if it's built for a specific task, it can't do anything else. Before production can take place, uh, a decision has to be made regarding the combination of factors of production to be used. How much land, how many workers, what technology and so on. So if before production takes place, there has to be an evaluation of the, the quantities and types of factor of production that's going to be needed. We observe that as output increases, unit costs also increase. Now, so, uh, this may be accounted for by the, the law of diminishing returns, or it may be simply accounted for by the fact that we're demanding more of this resource and therefore bidding the price up against ourselves. We, we want more of the resource, we demand more, so the price rises. Or it could be the law of diminishing returns. Within the production process, it may be possible to substitute one factor for another. It may be possible to have uh, more machines and less workers, for example. So, more capital substituted for less labour. And more and more capital equipment uh, of all sorts, ranging from very small handheld pieces of capital to larger uh, fixed pieces of capital, they are substituting for labour. Some resources are specific to the production of certain goods and can't be transferred over to the production of other goods without incurring great costs. So sometimes some factors of production are fixed. They can only do that. So a nuclear generating plant can only generate electricity, I presume. It can't become a bakery, or not easily become a bakery, it would have to be converted. So, factor substitutability. Sometimes factors of production are fixed, they can't be switched over into other areas. In the labour market, coal miners can't be transferred to services, office-based occupations, without considerable retraining they're not substitutable. It's not possible to take someone who's worked as a coal miner all his or her life, presumably most, most coal miners are, are male, but has worked all his life in, in, in the coal mines, uh, or the major part of his life, and then ask that person to become an accountant. Uh, it will require considerable retraining. There will be a big lag if it's possible. So sometimes factors of production are not substitutable. Now I mentioned earlier the law of diminishing returns. Well, The law applies in the short run. And the short run in economics has got a particular meaning. In economics the short run is when some factors of production are fixed in supply. So if a company has got um, a factory unit, that factory unit is fixed in size. So the company must be working in the short run. In the long run, everything is variable. So in that sense, the long run, well, it doesn't really exist. The long run is a planning horizon. The, pl the long run looks into the future and everything is variable. Everything can be changed. Plans can be changed. In economics, the short run is defined as a period of time during which at least one factor of production is fixed in supply. That's our definition. So therefore all companies operate in the short run. All companies have fixed capital, premises, etc. in the short run. In the long run, companies may vary the amounts of these resources that they use. 
So if we take this economic perspective, uh, we live in the short run and we plan in the long run. The fact that we're here now means it's a short run situation. We have certain resources and these are resources are fixed. It's what we've got right now, so it's fixed. So we live in the short run. In the long run, all of the factors of production are variable. And this is the definition of the long run in economics. So in economics, time periods have a particular meaning. In the short run, something is fixed in supply. If it's fixed in supply, it's short run in economics. In the long run, everything is variable. The law states, the law of diminishing returns states that the additions of successive equal amounts of a variable input to some fixed factor of production will eventually result in smaller and smaller amounts of extra output. Now that sounds complicated. As you'll see, I, I think lots of this sounds complicated. However, what the statement is saying is that if we add more and more workers to a situation where there's a fixed quantity of capital and a fixed size for for the production to take place if we add more and more workers initially output will increase more workers leads to more efficiencies they're able to break up the work there's division of labor and they're able to become more skilled at doing the job but if you continue to add workers eventually they'll start to get in each other's way and there will be smaller extra output for each worker because not all the workers will be used optimally and eventually if we continue to add workers eventually some workers will just be standing around waiting in which case they're not producing anything now I know that sounds like a, a silly example but that's the basis of the law of diminishing returns. The law of diminishing returns says that as we add variable factors, let's say we add workers to a production process, variable factors, as we add them, output will increase. And output will increase quite dramatically because the workers will become more skilled at doing the job. As we continue to add workers, the work is broken up into smaller and smaller bits. The workers may uh, exhibit extreme efficiency, very good efficiency, so output will then maximize. And if we continue to add workers, it will start to fall because some workers are not being used effectively. Eventually, if we, if we add too many workers, the output will fall completely. They'll just get in each other's way and nothing will happen. So as I said, it sounds complicated. If a company has a fixed amount of capital but can vary the number of workers it implies, eventually output will fall as more workers are implied. Which I said sounds even more complicated. But to just simply get in each other's way, there's too many of them. So the law of diminishing returns states there is an ideal amount of workers for a given amounts of capital. It only applies in the short run, diminishing returns. That's when we have a fixed resource a fixed amount of capital, let's say, a fixed area for production to take place. The factory size is fixed. The amount of capital is fixed. So we, we're operating in the short run. We have some fixed factors of production. The variable factor of production in the example here is labor. We add extra units of labor. Output increases. Output per worker, I should say, increases. But then output per worker diminishes as they get in each other's way. We need to also be careful about the concepts of total, average and marginal in economics. Uh, we may illustrate the law of diminishing returns by changes in the marginal output or changes in marginal cost. Now, we'll look at this in the, the next slide. We'll talk about the uh, average output and the marginal output per worker. So the law of diminishing returns uh, assumes that all workers are equally efficient. Bear that in mind. All workers are equally efficient. Average output is the total output divided by the number of workers. That's how we work out an average. 
marginal output is the change in the total output with the number of workers is increased by one. So we look at the, the total output of the, the business, the total output as it is now, then we increase the workforce by one more worker, what happens to the total output? Does it go up? How much does it go up? That's a measure of the marginal output. So let's take this table. Uh, here we have number of workers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Total output ranging from 20 to 114. Now if we divide the total by the number of workers, we get the average. So 20 divided by 1 is 20, 45 divided by 2 is 22 and a half. Those are the marginal outputs, sorry, the average outputs, sorry, average outputs. And the marginal outputs, well the marginal starts at, the first worker is 20, so it goes from 0 to 20. So the, the marginal output of the first worker is 20. The first worker contributes 20. The second worker, it goes now from from 20 to 25. So out, total output has moved from 20 to 45. So the second worker has added 25. So the two workers must have uh, started to work together, shared uh, the work. They are more efficient because two of them are doing, doing the work. The third worker, now output goes up to 63. From 45 to 63. But the difference between uh, the 63 and the 45 is 18. So the third worker has added 18. Now you can see the marginal output has gone from 20 to 25, now it's gone to 18. It's going down. The fourth worker, our total output goes to 78. That's 15 more units. So the marginal output is 15 for the fourth worker. The fifth worker output goes to 90. It goes up from 78 up to 90. And you can see that the the marginal output is therefore 12. 78 to 90 is 12. And that's how the table is calculated. You'll see that the average output is a lot different. Uh, the marginal output of the eighth worker is six, six units. That's what the eighth worker is contributing. Bearing in mind all the workers are equally efficient. It's just this is the organization of production. This is the law of diminishing returns. Uh, you can see that the the, out, the output of the eighth worker is just six. The margin, the, sorry, the average output as a consequence of implying eighth workers is 14.25. So there's a big difference between average and marginal. So it's important to be aware of the difference between total output, average output, marginal output. And the same idea crops up in total cost, average cost, marginal cost and so on. Total revenue, average revenue, marginal revenue. The same way of calculating it. In the long run, everything is variable. In the long run, we have what's known as returns to scale. That's the size of the organization. So in the long run, everything is variable. Scale means size. As the size of an organization changes, its unit costs may also change. If all of the inputs in the production process are increased by 10%, and output increases by more than 10% as a result, this is known as an economy of scale. Companies may use specialized machinery and expert staff when they grow, and this may reduce their unit costs. So, returns to scale is related to the size of the organization. As the organization grows, um, output may grow even faster. If output grows even faster, that's known as an economy of scale, an economy of size. For example, as an organization grows, it gains from bulk buying, specialized machinery and personnel, 
and research and development work. So large organisations have advantages over small organisations. Big companies can bulk buy. They can negotiate special discounts on purchases. They can also have special machinery made for specific tasks. And personnel within large organisations are highly specialised. They also have research and development work to try and reduce costs and bring out new products. So there are lots of advantages to having a larger organisation and as small companies grow bigger they start to benefit in these ways. If output increased by the same uh, proportion, let's say 10%, it's known as a constant return to scale. So if a company grows by 10% and output grows by 10% as a consequence, it's a constant return to scale. If output increases by a proportion less than the proportionate increase in inputs, say 10%, this is known as a diseconomy of scale. For example, as an organisation grows, it, may, uh, it becomes more difficult to control the employees. And the employees do not, uh, they do not see eye to eye with the organisation. They don't relate to the objectives of the organisation. So with larger companies, there may be diseconomies of scale, diseconomies due to size. Sometimes companies get too big. So it's different to, difficult to coordinate the activities of the business and control it. It's difficult to be efficient. So the idea of returns to scale, returns to size, is that it can be increasing returns to scale, constant returns to scale, or diminishing returns to scale. Increasing returns to scale because the company is able to benefit from specialised machinery, specialised personnel, research and development, discounts on, purch on purchases. So as it gets bigger, it becomes more efficient. Constant returns to scale, if the company grows by, let's say, 10%, output will grow by 10%. It's constant return. The forces that are building up against further growth exactly balance the forces that are in favour of growth. And eventually, the forces against growth against increases in size uh, will dominate. This, this is when diseconomies of scale will set in. Diseconomy of scale is when a company grows, let's say, by 10% and output grows by less than 10%. And the reason for that is because it's difficult for management to control very big organisations. There are all sorts of problems about communications, about workers not relating to the objectives of the business, motivation of workers. There's all sorts of issues that can detract from growth. So these are some of the issues that we need to look into when we consider means of production, back to Robin's definition. So when we talk about means, means of production, these are some of the issues. And that's all I'm going to deal with in this talk. So. I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching.